think people think that I'm the world's best breather and the happiest man going, but it's far from the fucking truth. But I now have the tools to regulate myself a lot more you know, by doing this for the last eight years. Welcome back to the Keegan and Company podcast. For those who are new to the show, my name is Keegan Hipgrave. And guys, if you haven't already, could I get you to jump over? Give us a little like and subscribe on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on, whether it's Apple, YouTube, Spotify. It's a great way for us to grow the platform, grow the podcast, and just have some incredible guests like I do today. In this episode, I'm joined by performance and wellness coach Rory Warnock. How are you, brother? Mate, I'm good. I'm a little bit tender, a little bit tired, but... A belly full of tacos. <laughs> man, we had a shout out Costa Tacos in Palmy, man. What a what a beautiful morning, man. Yeah, man, it's been good. It was uh, it was definitely a little bit wet for, uh, surprisingly wet, but it was good fun. For those who are listening, uh, we just, uh, Rory and I did the half marathon on the Gold Coast this morning. We actually were in Sydney a couple of weeks ago doing a session and, um, and it was just like, we're both going to be here. Both going to be on the Goldie. You're obviously here with Lulu Lemon, which I'm keen to talk about. Hosted a fucking amazing event, um, which I'm really keen to talk about. But, bro, how are you feeling after the half marathon? You're obviously like not only like a performance and wellness coach. We're going to talk about a lot about breath work today, which I'm super excited about. Um, but you're also an ultra marathon runner, which I think is is uh, super cool. And I'm super pumped to talk about how are the legs, how are you feeling after the half. Yeah, pretty good. I mean. This may sound strange to some people listening, but you know the half marathon for me was just a bit of a cruisy warm up, yeah. warm up <laughs> yeah, run. Good, mate. Yeah, so you're it good. wasn't. You no, know, I probably run you know, two or three half marathons a week. Yeah. Um. So it wasn't. I wasn't racing it particularly. Um. I've got a few bigger races planned for the next few months. So this was just a fun, a fun experience. Uh, come up with a little lemon, connect with you, and just kind of hang out with crew. Man, I'm I'm pumped to have you here. And the Lulu Lemon event was sick because you obviously came up with them. Uh, what did that look like? You had some, you had some great runners on the panel. Yeah, it was, it was unreal. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, man. So yesterday, so Ryan uh, and myself hosted two sessions uh, all around movement, ability, and breath work. Mm. And then today we hosted, a, well, I hosted a marathon mindset Q and A, a yeah. bit of a panel discussion. Uh, I led it. I did it with Jess Denson, who's an Olympic marathon runner, mm. incredible athlete. Uh, mother of two as well. Mm. Benny Seymour, who's heading off to the French, Italian, Swiss Alps in a few weeks for UTMB. Wow. And then Montana, uh, who has you know done many, many things, but was part of the Lululemon Further event in mm. the US, which was a six-day ultramarathon. Mm. So everyone comes, you know, the, the three uh, guests all came from different approaches, different angles, but all around running. Man, it's it's beautiful. Like these these workshops, like you get to meet such amazing crew. Like we we first met at the Whoop uh, uh, Whoop event when they relaunched the brand. I think probably earlier this year. Yeah, earlier this year. Yeah, it must and have been. Yeah, man. It must have been like January, February this year. I think so. And, and that was kind of. I think that was probably like that was probably the first experience I had with a proper breathwork session. Mm. And man, it was so wild. Like I think. I was, I was up the back a little bit and I don't know if you saw the video, but we, like I'm, I meditate, I, I've, I've, I'm, I'm very in tune with that, but I haven't done a proper breathwork session and we probably had maybe, I don't know, 50 people all laying down and I'm keen to get your thoughts on it. But man, I went into this like really deep meditative state. I thought I was just asleep because they were like <laughs> touching me, Brie and the crew were tapping me on the shoulder. They're like, like, wake up kids, like the session's done, but I was just so deep in this thing. Um, it was where we first connected, but it was like, it was such a great session. And from there, obviously started following your stuff. Um, love what you're putting out, not only in the breath work space, but also in the mental health space. I think this is why this conversation will be so cool to have today. Like the combination of sport, what you're doing with athletes, the performance space, but also the mental health space, your story, which I'm really grateful. With these workshops, do you ever pinch yourself to be like, man, I can't believe that I'm hosting these events with global brands. Yeah, always. Yeah. Like it's never something that I take for granted or that I take as a given, mm. you know, even sitting here with you and having a conversation with you, you know, I'm always appreciative and grateful to be able to do these kind of things, you know, working with Lululemon, working with Whoop, working mm. with whatever other brand. But um, they're not small brands, man. They're, they're like global billion dollar companies. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's pretty cool. And, and, you know, I've worked hard over the last five, six years to kind of build this space, build the business that I currently operate in. You know, working with the, the Swans, the Sydney Swans, and um, you know, 
the, the the longer that I sing off the same hymn, more people begin to listen, you know, and if uh, I can continue to support people far and wide throughout Sydney, throughout Australia, throughout the world, mm. then it'll just help people live a happier and healthier life. And, mm. you know, as you hopefully experience, and as you mentioned there, you know, this stuff works. Mm. You know, there's, there's a particular way that we can breathe just to reduce stress, to feel a bit more clear, more calm, more balanced with the addition of music, with the addition of hopefully my not so annoying Scottish voice gui <laughs> guiding you through as well. So it can, uh, you know, something so simple in theory, but the, the, the experience and the outcome can be pretty profound. I think the Scottish voice is very relaxing, brother. So um, I'm, I, I think it's, I think it's a, it's a great addition. You touched on the path getting to where you are now. And you said you've been, you've been doing breath work for five, six plus years now. Man, I'd like to zoom in on on the path how you got here because I know it's it's always a roller coaster. It's not like outside looking in, like fuck, Rory's Rory's killing it. Like he, he's doing so well. What are the biggest things that I need to know from whether it might be growing up, whether it be high school, coming out of high school? What are the key things that have led to you being where you are today? Yeah, where where do I begin? Um, start from the start, man. We've got nothing but time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Settle in. Yeah, man. I, I guess I guess to to touch on, you know, went to great school, come from a great family, but I struggled at school, you know, very dyslexic. Mm. You know, with that, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do after school. Yeah. I was always quite good at sport and that gave me a bit of purpose and that was my passion. Mm. I left school, went to university and studied strength and conditioning science. So I studied sports science essentially for three years. Then I, I guess the pressures of external society, friends, family, all the rest of it, I just moved into the corporate world. Mm. But, that, but that was your family, like your family's backgrounds in finance, yeah? Yeah, all finance, all corporate. And Got that, a bunch of brothers. That's all in, yeah, five brothers, you know, so that's all I knew. Talk about like growing up in a competitive environment. Yeah, I know. Yeah, six, <laughs> Mate, that, six, six lads. Wow. How was, you're, like it's obviously, are you, do you reckon you are a competitive person? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm externally competitive, but also internally competitive. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess from there, you know, when I was about twenty two, even twenty one, mm. I was in you know, diagnosed with depression and anxiety. I didn't really know what that was or what that meant. I, you know, from for about three years, I was kind of crying myself to sleep most nights and confused. Now, what I understand is monkey mind. But mm. back then, when I was a lot younger, I'm now thirty, so it's about eight, nine years ago you know, I called it scrambled egg head. You know, I just felt like someone had a whisk and was just scrambling my head. So I just constantly confused and sad and low and confused and anxious, all the rest of it. Mm. So from that, you know, I didn't want to be on antidepressants. The doctor just gave me that white pill and off you go. Mm. I probably took antidepressants for about a year. Then someone recommended I try breath work. I thought breath work, that sounds a bit woo woo. Yeah. You know, what on earth is breath work? Someone's going to tell me to breathe in a certain way and it's going to change the way that I think, I feel, I act, I behave. Mm. You know, but I went along to this one hour session and, you know, without sounding too cringe, you know, that one hour changed the whole direction of my life. Mm. I felt joyful. I felt strong. I felt empowered. I felt happy. I felt calm. I felt uh, euphoric. Mm. You know, all these amazing words I hadn't felt for years. So inevitably I became hooked on feeling good. Mm. Started practicing more and more, you know, three or four times a week at various sessions throughout London. Then when I came to Sydney in 2019, I just thought, you know, if breathwork can help me feel this good, could I help other people feel this good? Yeah. So then just moved into this world, weird, one, one, weird, wonderful and wacky space of breathing. Mm. And it's just kind of snowball effect from there. Isn't that the thing? Like once you have a personal impact or something has a personal impact on you, then that's where you want to push that message because you've seen the impact like straight away like it's, it's impacted you personally you know the power of it before we move on into the breath work session in terms of performance and mental health i do kind of want to zoom into when you're 21 22 and you're going in you're in the you said you were clinically diagnosed with depression and, and you're on antidepressants what did it look like like what what was the environment are you around are you knocking around with mates you're on the piss like what what do you think were the key drivers or do you think it was just partly genetic yeah, man, it's a good thought and good question. I think it's a number of different variables and aspects to almost lead to a, the perfect storm where mm. I didn't really have a purpose and passion. Mm. I don't really know my meaning or direction in life. I was a little bit confused, a little bit lost. You know, I was doing the typical early 20s, living in London. I was on the pace every Thursday, Friday, Saturday, late nights, talking, you know, 4 or 5, 6 a.m., yeah. you know, and doing that for weeks, months, almost years. 
Um, so I think just the perfect storm, I ha- you know, my friends are great and I still love them to bits, mm. but I didn't want to live that life. Um, mm. So I kind of went off and got into more yoga, movement, running, yeah. breath work. <clears throat> it's, mate, it's very, it's very wholesome, yeah. But like when, when you sit down with the doc, the doctor, and he's just like, mate, we're gonna, you've got depression. Like, you, how, how did you come to that? And how did you even know to go to a doctor? Like, because that's totally like, is it something like, like, oh, it's probably not normal to be crying yourself to sleep every night, right? Like, and I, I say that, you know, specific, like directly. Like, it's, it's. I imagine there's probably other guys going through something similar, but they can't quite articulate it, and they don't know which way to go. How did you know that that was the right way to go? Oh, look, if I'm honest, there's some pretty dark thoughts. And I think, you know, when the thoughts became darker and darker and I didn't like the voice in my head mm. and it became louder and louder, you know, even times when I go up to Edinburgh and cry in my mum's arms. And I remember, you know, I was 21 or 22 and cry in my mum's arms. I was like, that's not right. You know, you know that's kind of the kind of thing that children do, not adults mm. or not men, perceived to be men anyway. Um, so I don't know, man. I think, um, I think... Uh, when when the months became years and you know one year became two two became three mm. i thought right something has to change here so i went on to the doctor and i didn't really know another way out that's mm. why i started taking the medication which i absolutely needed at that time and mm. you know for a lot of people definitely take it mm. but then when i found the more a more holistic life and better lifestyle choices mm. you know routines habits etc waking up early, going to bed early, yeah. eating better food, drinking less booze, running, yoga, Pilates, breathwork, you know, all the good stuff that's going to actually benefit you, which we all know how to do and yeah. that it does help. Mm. Um, that helped a lot. Now, the, the medication is, it's an interesting one because there's obviously that, there's that conversation where it's just like, oh, people are just over-prescribing and they just over-prescribe, over-prescribe. And, and I'm not sure where I sit because I've seen people who are really close to me in very dark situations, right? Like suicidal and they need the medication to get back on track, you know, and, and people say you should never have it. I, was like, I don't know if that's the case. Cause there's obviously two extremes. Like there's the, the extreme end and there's a, I don't know, very, very easy going end, but it, it helped her. It helped her get out of it. And don't get me wrong. She still struggles. Like it's a daily struggle for her, but she needed that to get out of it. And I, and I don't, I don't ever want to put words in your mouth, but is that something that, Helped? Do you think the medication helped you until you found the breath work, until you found meditation, until you changed your environment? Hundred percent, all, all of the above. Yeah. You know, it got me out of a hole, mm. and I definitely think it's right for some people at a specific time in their life. Um, but to not change your life, to continue doing the negative things, and just take the medication and think it's going to help, it's just narrow-minded and just dumb. You know, you, you've got you got to. For, for me, what I believe, you know. For what I did and what I believe moving forward for anyone else, you know, if you have to take medication at that time, and I'm not a doctor, just to caveat that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You take, and me both, brother. Yeah, take, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, don't listen to us. Yeah. You know, take the medication to get out of a certain period of hole, mm. but then change your life. You know, mm. if you're still going out Thursday, Friday, Saturday, boozing, having very little sleep, you're still going to be pretty fucked up. Mm. Like, you got to change the life to become healthier and happier, right? Were you nervous to come off the meds? I don't think I was, to be honest, I think I was ready for it, yeah. you know, and, and I, I felt like I was in a much better place and I could regulate my emotions and I could control the way I was thinking a bit more mm-hmm. rather than having these irrational, unconscious thoughts that were dictating my life, essentially. Mm, but you know where I'm coming from? Like, I imagine there's probably a crew who might be a bit reliant on the medication or who are nervous to come off the medication because it's like, well, it's the medication that's making me feel good. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Hundred percent. And and I also believe that you you've got to swap the medication for something. Yeah. You know, you can't just almost go off at cold turkey and mm. be like, "Hey, I'm gonna be fine now." Mm. You know, like, and don't get me wrong, I'm definitely not cured and enlightened. You yeah. know, just because I I teach and practice breathwork doesn't mean I'm the happiest and healthiest man in the world. You know, mm. I still have my bouts of depression. I still have my moments of anxiety. Mm. You know, I think people think that I'm the world's best breather and the happiest man going, but yeah. it's far from the fucking truth. You know, but I now have the tools to regulate myself a lot more, you know, by, by doing this for the last eight years. I think that's, I think that's partly the reason why I love hanging out with you, man, to be honest, is like, you're so open about your own experiences. Like you, like you, you're more than happy to have the conversation. And like from when we first met, I was like, this guy's the fucking happiest dude I've ever met. <laughs> like you, like you've got this calming thing about you. Even when we did the breath work session, like even just like listen to your like Scottish accent, I, like, I feel just naturally calm, but I'm like, even hanging out with you more, doing a session, hanging out with you today, I was like, you're more than happy to be like, yeah, man, I, I cry. Like I, my emotions 
are naturally I ride the highs and lows. Why are you so happy to have the conversation? Like why like why are you so open? Because mate, to be honest, most blokes aren't that open and talking about what's going on. I appreciate that, man. And I love hanging out with you as well. I I don't know. I, I think I've because I've not got anything to hide. Yeah. I don't really have a fear around it. Mm. You know, I whether or not people who are gonna watch this or listen to this, you know, like me or not, I don't really mind. Mm. You know, so if if um if people enjoy what I say and, you know, find out of value or, or interest, you know, fantastic, cool. And I, I'm, I'm hopefully I can, we, we can help people. Mm. Um, so I think just being open-minded, being open at communicating is going to benefit people's lives. I found um, just personally, like when I'm, when I've like talked about something that I haven't spoken about before, right. Especially with mates, it kind of takes the weight off. Like, and I don't know, I don't know what it is. It's like, you might have this little thing that's sitting on your chest and you just like, you just bury it down. You just fucking push it down. But then when you're open about it, even like in, in a public format like this, like this is a, like a long form thing. There's going to be some things that I'm not going to talk about, which is fine. It's personal to be honest, it's no one's business. But then when there are certain things that I'm more open about discussing, like being medically retired from footy, or um, it might be, you know, coming off alcohol, or it might be like struggling with my own mental health or being stressed or not having the balance correct. When I talk about these things, it's like, no, it's really weird. It's like, no one can like really hold that against me. And it's weird because it's, I'm doing it to myself. It's like, to be, and to be honest, no one probably gives a shit anyway. But I, I think there's something in that in terms of just like letting go of something. I agree. But I also think, you know, the more open I can be with you, the more open you will feel with me mm. and the more comfortable you'll feel with me. Yeah. You know, so I think being open and honest in a friendship and in a, an environment helps people just connect with you. Yeah. You know, and, and I love connection. Mm. You know, I just want to be connected to like-minded people doing like-minded things mm. and just live in a good space. Right. So I think being open, honest, vulnerable, you know, vulnerability is a strength, um, can just allow us to live a, a, a more connected, better life. Mm, I think, I think about that all the time. We did a, we did a chat in a gym last, last week, maybe a week or two weeks ago for men's mental health month. Um, this episode will probably go out in a couple of weeks, just FYI. But when, we did that event. It was pretty much like I had the owner of a gym, a Torah in Burley. Harry, he's a fucking legend, such a good dude. He's like, I want to do something for Men's Mental Health Month. And I was like, well, what's the goal? Like, what do you want to do? He's like, I want to bring community together and I want blokes to be able to feel like they can have a conversation. I was like, right, well, sweet. Let's get in and let's have a lift. Like, let's feel mad about ourselves. We did a little chest and arms pump. We felt great, man. Kind of like what mate, we- mate, you look great too. <laughs> kind of like what we did yeah. uh, with a bit more shoulders in there. But anyway, we- <laughs> <laughs> we, we did we did the lift everyone's feeling mad and blokes ranging from like 45 down to early 20s and we sat in there afterwards we kind of like sat in like this little circle i gave like a little spiel about like why vulnerability is a strength and not seen as a weakness um i gave some personal examples why why like how we lose you know what the recent statistics from what november sent through is just like suicide is still the biggest killer for men aged between 23 and uh 45, 45, 44, 45. It's still the biggest killer. And so we're obviously still not having the conversations and we're not creating genuine impact. I think we're doing a lot of talking, which is great. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of creating awareness is what this whole podcast is about. But we actually sat down, there's like 15 of us, gave them the chat and then we did like a, the triple H. It's kind of like a, um, like a little exercise where we talked about, um, you say like your hero, so someone you look up to, a highlight, something that's good that's happened in the last day, week, month, year, but then also a hardship. Bro, it was wild, like the amount of conversation that we had. Like I talked about my own stuff. Um, one of the other boys jumped on the back of it because it was very similar. And everyone went around the circle. One guy passed on it, um, which was fine. It was, it's no, no, not compulsory to talk. <laughs> so like whenever there's no such thing as forced vulnerability. Um, but afterwards, it was so great. Boys were hugging, like laughing, like having a good time and felt connected. And I think that's the best way to create community. And what I'm getting at is that when I see you in these workshops, um, yes, the Q&A and the MC, which you um, moderated beautifully this afternoon, um, you're creating that community. Do you, do you feel that? Is that something that's intentional that comes out of breath work or is it just something that, you know, you like to do? Honestly, I think it's something I like to do. I don't think there's much strategy or process behind what I'm trying to do in that way. Yeah, I, I do often believe that leading with vulnerability helps almost just open the gate for other people to be vulnerable as well and know it's a safe space. Talk about no. that more. Yeah, man. So, you know, I, I, we, we spoke about sauna earlier and you showed me the sauna outside and 
I'll often just go to a sauna with a mate, you know, you know, sit in a, a glass box, sweat your nuts off in your little budgies. And I almost, you know, I almost, not you almost, sorry, I call it therapy. Yeah. Because I go there with a mate and it's a mate, how are you getting on? You know, and they're like, yeah, you know, I'm good. Yeah, work's pretty busy. Yeah, no, yeah the girlfriend or the wife is, you know, it's, it's all right. I'm like, well, what do you mean it's all right? Let's have a chat about that then. Mm. You know, then they open up. They're like, yeah, fuck, I've not spoken about that for, for months or, you know, I've not, not had a chance to speak to someone about that. Because mm. often if you're in a big uh, group or uh, an open environment in the pub, people don't want to do that. Yeah. You know, if it's like eight, eight lads sitting around the table, you don't want to then open up and be like, oh, mate, it works real tough at the moment. Like I'm getting slammed, like yeah. not meeting my numbers, blah, blah, blah. So I find when you're you're one on one and you just actually open up to a friend yep. or ask a friend, you know how they're actually getting on. Mm. You know, it's a it's a good opportunity to to really be real with each other. Mm. Um, so yeah, sauna therapy. It's like a little truth box, yeah. But you but you have that aura about you, and I think certain crew do. Well, I find that certain guys like you're very easily approachable, and I, and I imagine it's because you're open about your own vulnerabilities and own struggles. Yeah, man, I appreciate you saying that, and I think. Hopefully people don't think I have, you know, a toxic, negative, arrogant ego, yeah. you know, where you know everyone has an ego, right? But I but I feel I always want to be approachable, yeah. you know, especially as you know, just as a human as the human that I am, mm. but also as a coach, you know. If I can be the best coach to allow people to feel safe, open, vulnerable with me, mm. then that can help develop the relationship as well. But it's rare. Like it's I there's so m- I, so many mates that I've known for years. I've known for 10, 15, 20 years and I don't feel like I can have a conversation with them. Not from any fault of his own. It's just not the, it's not the relationship. But for you, just knowing you for the short amount of time, like what, six months, I feel like I can talk to you about most things. Like you know, even when we're having the, when we had that session in gym at Virtus um, a couple of weeks ago, I walked away from that session and I'm like, man, I just I have all this energy. I felt like it was just a really, it was just open. It was just open chat. And so, man, I, 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 I just wanted to applaud you for that because it is special and it's rare. It's not, I don't think many blokes can do that. Thank you, bro. I appreciate it. And you too as well. You too. Um, I do want to get into the breath work. And I, before we do coming out, you know, we, we did a little detour, you know, you came out of um, using antidepressants and you said that uh, change your environment, you know, how, how did you, you talked about how you first got into breath work. Why did you stick around with breath work? Because it works. Yeah. You know, it, it worked for me. It works for me. Um, the effects were incredibly apparent and immediate. Yeah. You know, nothing, nothing are wrong, nothing wrong with meditation, but often to get the value and the benefit from meditation, the barriers to entry are quite great. You know, they're a little bit higher. Um, often if I were to meditate, say for 20 minutes, I would finish the 20 minute meditation and feel either the exact fucking same mm. or sometimes a little bit more anxious. With breath work, certain types of breathing, uh, exercises, techniques, tools, whatever you want to call it, mm. I'd feel more relaxed in the moment. I'd straight feel away. Straight away, man. Mm. You know, with the, you know, with the addition of music, without music, you know, breathing a little bit faster with some breath holds, breathing a bit slower just to downregulate. Mm. Um, I loved how quick uh, you could change the physiology and psychology mm. just through breathing. You know, yeah. something we do 25,000 times a day, mm. every second of every day, but breathing you know, changing the rhythm, the rate, the depth can completely alter how you think, feel and behave. Tell me about the science behind it. Like what, what is it actually happening? Cause I, I feel it like from lived experience and from talking to other people, I've seen it and I've experienced it myself. What is it doing when we actually slow things down? And to be honest, then I'm sure that there's a variety of different techniques for breath. Like what is it, ha- what's happening to us when we do go into a breath work session? Yeah. It, it, you know, just to give one example here, Often we're in a high stress state, you know, we're in that sympathetic fight or flight, fight, flight or freeze state. Therefore, to try and feel more relaxed and more calm, you have to move into the parasympathetic, the rest and digest. Mm. We know that your inhale is sympathetic, so raises the heart rate, fight or flight, and the exhale is parasympathetic, rest and digest. So simply elongating, lengthening the exhale can help you move more into relaxed, calm state. Mm a technique that I personally have used for about four or five years that I recommend with everyone, I recommend to everyone that I've worked with is four, six breathing. So use your nose four in through the nose, six out through the nose. I use this religiously before bed, you know, bed for a lot of people is a place of relaxation or sex. For me, it's a place of anxiety. All I want to do is get my eye mask on, put my mouth tape on, 
do my breath work and get the fuck to sleep. Mm. And, you know, breath work to downregulate the nervous system, quiet the racing mind is one of the most efficient and effective ways to do that. Are you pausing? Because you, you breathe in, so like... Four, four in, nice and relaxed. Oh, holy shit, man, relax, bro. Sorry, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ner- you got me nervous, man. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a light, Sorry, it's a bro. light, gentle in. Yeah. So it, it might sound a little bit like this. And then long six out. So real relaxed, four in, six out, four in, six out, and then just do it until you drift off to sleep. And so you would just keep going constantly? Just do it until you drift off, yeah. Really? But I imagine you can probably manipulate the breath. So yes, when we're down-regulating, but I imagine there's probably times where you want to build adrenaline or you want to get amped up, I imagine, and that's probably stuff, and correct me if I'm wrong, probably stuff you're doing with the swans and, and performance crew. Yeah, 100%, bro. And, you know, one way to shift your nervous system is to feel more relaxed, more calm. Another way is to bring energy and alertness in. So rather than putting the emphasis on the exhale to feel more relaxed, you put the emphasis on the inhale to feel more energy. Kind of like what I was just doing before. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, So that's how you feel energy. So, you know, nasal breathing is functional and that will help calm mind and body. Mm. Mouth breathing is more dysfunctional and that will bring more stress to the body. When I say stress, it could be conscious stress. You know, exact same as when you're in a gym, you do a squat, you promote, you know, stress and muscle to promote positive adaptation. Exact same as breathing. You can use your breath, mouth breathing to add conscious stress or alertness, we'll call it for that word. So give me a couple of examples. You referred to the gym. Give, give us an example. So to, to bring conscious stress to your nervous system is a fast inhale through the mouth with a relaxed exhale through the mouth. <sighs> And you can do that between 30 to 50 times. I'll do about 30. Once I've done it 30 times, if my heart rate's at, you know, during wakefulness, roughly 60 to 70 during the day, if I do 30 fast breaths, it can go up to 120. Really? So you're using breathing, tapping into your heart rate, increasing adrenaline, increasing cortisol, just to feel more energy. So when would be a good time to use this? You said like before a lift, before a max um, bench or squat, uh, is before a game? Like before the, do the Swans boys do it before the game? A number do. A lot of the younger boys uh, need to reduce the level of arousal because they're feeling too amped up, mm. too anxious. So they use slower breathing. Some of the older boys who are, you know, have done this for 10 years plus, yeah. you know, need to get up for the game a bit more. So they use faster breathing. So understanding who you are, what you need, and how to fulfill that need is pretty important. Mm. So if you're going to do a max lift and you're tired, you know, you're going to do deadlift, squat, bench, whatever it may be, 30 fast breaths, get the adrenaline going, get yourself up for it. Big breath in. As you know, create that intra-abdominal pressure, nice Mm. spinal stability, then lift. Gotcha. Yeah, because I just think personally, and I remember like, say... If you know when you're big day, like you do a lot of workshops, you travel a lot. I imagine you're probably on a flight early in the morning. You get there, you probably got like a little bit of anxious energy, especially when you're, you know, presenting to a big global organization, especially if it's in the afternoon. For me personally, like I'm drained. I'm tired. Like I'm yawning going into these presentations, these workshops. Maybe it might be hosting a QA. and a And I'm like, we'll just get it. Just get on with it and just do it. And I think I'm starting to get, not starting, I, I do it. I think fairly well where I can just like put a mask on and then for the first like five minutes, I'm like overconfident and then I just like naturally lean into it. But I think now I kind of want to like try the breath work thing and try and get my heart rate up and be like, okay, well, I'd be so much quicker instead of having the five, 10 minutes of probably overusing more energy just to get amped up. 100% man. And, and just before I flew up here on what day is today? Is it Saturday today? Saturday. I flew up on Thursday. And just before I flew up, I had a, an event with BlackRock. And, you know, some of these you know, men and women will have long hours over five, six, seven days. And I was telling them about this upregulating breathing, you mm-hmm. know, 30 to 50 fast breaths. We tried it out. They felt the difference. They felt a change. And they're like, this, is like, this feels great because mm-hmm. I'd rather do this than have a coffee at four or five o'clock in the afternoon when it's going to have a half-life of eight to 12 hours, depending mm-hmm. on the study, the sample size, whatever. You know, use breathing. 30 fast breaths, mm. stimulate the body and then get on with the work or get on with the task at hand. I, I, I will often, sorry, Keeks, yeah. I will often, I will often use this in my car. So if I drive, you know, sometimes I can be in eight locations in a day, mm. drive, 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 you know, 
you got to be on, you know, you're giving your energy to other people. Mm. Then at the end of the day, I'm, like, I'm absolutely shagged. Mm. And, you know, to try and stimulate the body, I don't want to have that coffee. So I'll just do 30 fast breaths in the car. But right, let's go. Showtime. We're on. So is that like religious for you now? Like you're just, so, you've done it for so long. It's just, it's just natural. hundred percent. It's very habitual. And then, um, you know, I'm often asked, you know, how, how many, sorry, I'm often asked, how often do I practice breath work? You know, I will do some kind of breath work between five to eight times a day, mm. you know, whether that's me listening to you speaking and I'm consciously breathing slower and deeper, mm. you know, to bring a bit more balance back to my nervous system, whether I'm nasal breathing whilst doing a half marathon, whether I'm doing 30 fast breaths to stimulate the body. Mm. If I have something to do, a call, whatever it may be. What do you think is the biggest barrier to entry with the breath? Cause obviously it's niche. Like it's, it's a niche thing. Like we, we talked about it before. Like, obviously there's a lot more, it's a lot more, breath work stuff popping out but maybe that's just because the circles were knocking around it i still think it's super niche how would you go what would you say to someone who's just wanting to start getting into breath work i mean this is such a plug but i don't get paid for it so i'm gonna do it anyway <laughs> you know i create i created <laughs> hail breath work for that reason yeah. you know kind of going back to your question it is slightly niche it's definitely not mainstream yet if you wanted to try breath work check out hail breath work you know Hail H A L E. What what is hell? Tell hail, me you know it. Um, you know I I I wanted to move things slightly away from my name. You know, so I, I created Hail Breathwork, which is a series of on demand breathwork sessions. You know that you can use anywhere, anytime. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Music, all the digital streaming platforms. Volume one is for calm. Volume two is for energy. Volume three, four, and five will be coming out. Three is for balance. Four is for sleep. Five is for cold exposure to ice baths. And it's obviously completely free. If it's, it's all free. You know, it's all free. I, I've worked with Stu Turner, who's uh, one half of Setmo, mm. Sydney-based DJ producer. He's created amazing sounds, amazing music that you hear. Um, unbelievable what he does. Yeah. I've been, uh, you know, and I'm guiding the breathwork over. So if you're new to breathwork or if you're listening and you're like, what the fuck is breathwork? Who's this wee Scotsman chatting about breathing? <laughs> yeah, man. Check it out. <laughs> see what you think of it. That is the best. The best. That is the best. It's the thing best to man. do. It's the best. <laughs> it's yeah, the best, yeah. man. That is the best uh, option that I recommend. You know, I created it as well because so regularly I do corporate breathwork sessions or you know events with Whoop or Little Lemon or whoever it may be, and people say, oh, you know, where can I practice now? You know, I'm you know I even got a message yesterday saying, hey, I'm in Brisbane and I want to practice you. I'm like, well, I'm in Sydney. You know, mm. I can't do that. So I uh, I thought, well, how can I bring breathwork you know to the mainstream and let anyone practice anywhere anytime whether you're my friends in london whether it's you up here in goldie or my mum in edinburgh you know mm -hmm. you can just tap into headphones on and just get the benefit what what does it look like is it like a five minute session 20 minutes hour session what what does it look like so each volume is five sessions two minutes five minutes five minutes ten minutes and ten minutes so variety sessions minimal effective dose tap into it. everyone has two minutes i'm pretty sure everyone has 10 minutes as well yeah different intentions for different session as well and just explore the session and see what you like mm. can you tell me the difference between doing a two minute session versus a hour session because i've heard there's a there's i'm pretty sure there's a new um breath house or there's a breath workshop here in gold coast burley definitely think they're from melbourne they're doing like 45 minute sessions we did a whoop like mm. half an hour 45 minute session what's what's the difference what can i expect yeah, I mean, like the, the 45 minute sessions, for example, which I prefer and love, definitely, uh, you just go deeper, you know, you, you have a deeper state of relaxation, mm. um, depending on what the intention is, and how the facilitator hosts the session, you know, some can can often even be psychedelic, um, which is quite interesting, quite fun. Um, you know, depending on what the techniques you use, depending on the music. So yeah, you know, I think the easiest way to explain the difference between a two minute session and a 40 minute session is just a deeper relaxation. You can go deeper. hundred percent. I had a, um, two of my dear friends who are in the NRL last year, at the end of last year, they did like this really wholesome weekend where they went away with a mindset coach. Who's also <clears throat> licensed uh, breath coach who's went and studied and it was like very wholesome. They worked on their values, their mindset. And I think on the Sunday, on the last day or second last day, they did a breath work session. And I think it was about an hour and one of the boys, they had a film photographer there, they were um, shooting some content as well. And they captured one of my mates going through this this session. And bro, he went so deep. He's like, his eyes were almost open, like not rolling to the back of his head, but they were kind of open. His arms were like clammed. And he said, <clears throat> and it, I was just like, this guy's having a, a trip. Like it, look, it looks like he's having a psychedelic trip. He was hallucinating. He was like 
making all these sounds and one of the the boys next to him he's like I couldn't go deep because I was just like firstly worried a little bit about about my uh, mate and then he come to and he's just like like he just got out of a sleep and he's just like I was having the weirdest dreams <laughs> And he's just like, bruh, you were hallucinating. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> yeah. hectic. Can you tell me, do you, can you un- tell, uh, try and get me to understand that? Like what was happening in that situation? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, lot of things happening, but just a quickly touch on, um, I did a corporate session last week in in Sydney, in the city, and we're on, I think we're on the 32nd floor, so pretty high up, right? Mm. And uh, there's a small group. And at the end of the session, we had a bit of a chit chat, you know, just to, you know, ease people out of the experience mm. and uh, one of the guys said oh yeah it's really strange the building started to vibrate throughout that session i was like mate the building's not vibrating <laughs> like, yeah man. and i was like that you were vibrating yeah. and then and then his colleague who i think was a good friend too just started wetting themselves <laughs> laughing was like bro like the building was not vibrating yeah and i was obviously standing beside them i was like nothing was moving and he's like for real i was like yeah yeah like you must have felt like you're vibrating and the person beside him said that he felt like he was levitating, like wow. felt like he was floating. So, I mean, this is what I find so fascinating. You know, we have access to the breath 24 seven, right? Every second of every day, mm. but you can breathe in a certain way and it just changes your whole life. You know, yeah. to have that kind of, you know, my first experience, I had an out of body experience. And when I go deep, like a 45 minute, 45 minute session, I can almost, not almost, sorry, I keep saying almost. I can have experiences where I'll be looking at myself and I'm talking to myself. Every time? Not every time. Not every time. You know, t- t- I don't know what the variables are, but depending on how I'm feeling emotionally, you know, what is happening, you know, in my mind, in my body. But um, but that's pretty mad, hey? Can you go can you go deeper because you do it so often? Um maybe. And I'm more and I'm more open to it. Mm. You know, and and you know, I'm I kind of surrendered to that feeling. Mm. A lot of people can because of the physical feelings that you mentioned, Keeks, you know, the hands can do this, you know, the, the body vibrations, a bit of lightheadedness, people slightly stop mm. and they think, oh, I don't, I'm not, I don't like this. Whereas someone like myself just speeds up. Yeah. I'm like, I know this is safe. I'm just breathing, you know, surrender to the feelings and mm. just see where it takes you. So is that is that a big part of it? Like being okay and sort of like giving up the control and just kind of like blanking your mind? I'm trying to like paint a picture of like yeah, how I mean, to best get there because it's so fun. Like it's so great. And when you come out of it, we talked about it beforehand. You, For me, I don't know. It's just like I felt clear. I felt energized afterwards. I felt like my problems weren't as big of a problems as what they were. Life feels better. Bro. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's not really so much about clearing the mind because that would just happen inevitably mm. and and as a byproduct of the music and the conscious breathing mm. but it's more or what i'd recommend is more just surrendering to the feelings that may come up mm. you know if you're thinking oh fuck like my hands are doing some weird thing mm. because i'm breathing more than my metabolic demand i'm exhaling more co2 therefore the body can't absorb oxygen as easily to the peripherals blah 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 mm. you know it's safe it's fine yeah. you know for an acute period 30 40 50 minutes it's absolutely fine if you were to breathe chronically 24 seven like that, <sighs> yeah, we'd have fucking problems, mm. but you're not going to breathe chronically in that way. The body often, not always, is a wonderful machine. As soon as the practice finishes, you bring some movement back into your fingers, your mm. body, you kind of get a little bit of movement, drink some water, hydrate, mm. you know, everything comes back to normal. Yeah. You know, so just go for it during the session and, and enjoy the experience. Going back to my friend who had that experience, can you tell me a little bit about what was happening in that in that instance because he, he even came out of it and he's just like talked about all these past things that have come up there was a there was a few things which is obviously not my place to talk about at all but he um he had these three things that popped up and he said he thought he was going for hours but it was only like i don't know 30 minutes 40 minutes and he actually addressed those things afterwards it was part of the weekend they had goals and intentions they actually journaled after the session and obviously, it's same thing. He was like, felt like he was levitating, felt like he was looking down on himself. But he had these three things. Can you tell me like what's happening there? Honestly, not really. Yeah. Like, and I've read so many papers and so much literature and yeah. so much science behind it. And I can, you know, I can explain, you know, what's happening within the physiology, you know, with the relationship between your, your biochemistry, your oxygen, your CO2. But what's happening with your neurochemistry, that's harder to understand. Mm. You know, for example, if you try and scan the brain whilst in that state to do a functional MRI, mm. you know, you have to, you know, as I'm sure you know, it's like 
you know, being a footy player, getting in a functional MRI, you have to be still and you can't move, right? Mm. So like, you couldn't do that breathwork practice to then scan the brain to understand what parts of the brain mm. are being activated and deactivated. Mm. So where's lighting up in the brain? Where's quieting down? What people are speculating is, you know, the, the fear and threat part of the brain, your amygdala is uh, quietening, for example, mm. um, less activation. Your prefrontal cortex is being activated and that is associated with your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions. Mm. So often if people have vision or visual visualizations of people, places, things, that's because the oxygenated blood and mm. the activation is at the prefrontal cortex. So that's what people are speculating. There may be papers out there. I haven't read every single paper, I'm sure. You haven't? Um, come on, man. I know, come on. Speed <laughs> yeah, up, Rory. Yeah. I, I think I've read quite a lot, but I, there may be stuff, but I haven't read anything. And, you know, even the... You know, even the psychedelic approach, you know, and and I cannot explain how it makes you feel like you're levitating. Mm. I cannot explain how it makes me have an out of body experience. Mm. You know, I can't explain how it um it makes me feel empowered. Mm. You know, these like these you know empowered, strong, proud. Mm. You know, science can't explain that mm. yet. Mm. Mate, I I want to tie this to mental health because mm. I, I, it is like it's obviously had a profound impact on you. What do you think are the biggest positive effects that breath work does for mental health? And I'm, I'm sure we probably alluded to it, but directly. I mean, you know, going back a few steps with anxiety, depression, stress, you know, if you can reduce anxiety, reduce stress and feel a little bit happier, mm. so less depressed, life is better. Yeah. You know, life is often pretty chaotic and busy, you know, especially for us men, for example, where we don't really have opportunities to be proud of ourselves mm. or be grateful and for me to do a breathwork session, you know, I'll speak for myself here. I can't speak for all men, but I'm pretty hard on myself. And there's a, a seriously strong voice in my head, which is often quite negative. Um, but when I do breathwork sessions, you know, and often when I guide breathwork sessions at the end, I'll ask the participants to think of something they're proud of mm. or think of something they're grateful for, you know, and I'll look around and I'll see people smile or I'll see like a tear come down. So, you know, you know, people think of their kids, people think of their partner, people think of themselves or something they've done. You know, maybe the first professional footy game you had, mm. you know, the work that you put in to get to that position, you know, so I guess all those aspects <clears throat> just to improve general health, happiness and mental health is pretty, pretty good. Do you think you're good at taking your own advice? In what way? Well, you said you, you talk around um, like what you're grateful for, what you're proud of is these things that you're implementing. Like are you, I'm, you know, we've spoken about before that you're very open about talking about the highs and lows of of your own mental health journey? Is there something that, not that you're struggling with now, but like, are you conscious of implementing this daily? And, it, and, it's, and it's okay if you don't, like it's part of Yeah, it. no, it's a, it's a nice question. Um, I think I am. And I think one thing that I'm good at is being grateful. Mm. You know, every morning I walk my dog and I look at Bondi Beach and I'm grateful. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, and I'm proud of who I am and who I've become. Mm. You know, and I'm proud of the man I am now. You know, 10 years ago, if I were to look at myself in the mirror, I'd hate myself. Mm. I don't hate myself anymore. Um, but I'm very hard on myself. Mm. But I, I have high expectations of what I can do. Mm. And I know I'm only here for, you know, maximum another 60, 70 years. Mm. And I want to make the most of it. But there, you know, there's definitely, you know, I'm going back to therapy, for example. So there's definitely things that I could do to, to improve my life for sure. I have that. I always think about this, the, Typically for guys, especially probably successful guys, they are super hard on themselves. And it's probably a big motivator of how they've got so to be so successful. I think about that all the time because I was like, at what point at what point do you pull it back and just like, I don't know, want the, want the simple life? Like, I, I don't know, because for me, and I'm keen to hear your thoughts on it as well, like, I feel like I'm just, I'm in a grind at the moment and I'm comfortable. Like, I'm actually happy that I'm in this grind because... To be honest, I don't have any real responsibilities. Like I don't have a partner, I don't have kids, I don't have a dog. I'm I'm really enjoying just being in this grind at the moment. And maybe it's, there's a feelings of like not being good enough and, and like probably internal drivers that are doing that as well. But I was like, I don't want to lose that now because I want to set myself up. I'm like, and I'm keen to hear your thoughts on on why you're going so hard now. Because I look at it like, you, mate, you're you're a super busy guy. You know, you, you're doing breath work sessions. You know, you're flying to the Gold Coast. You're flying all, mate. You're about to do a 200k race um, overseas, which I do want to talk about. Not just yeah, I want to dive into this. I want to finish this thought. But what? But what is it about it? Like, why do you think that we're 
comfortable going hard now? And and is it is it that feeling of like being hard on ourselves? Do you think it's a healthy thing? Do you think it's something that we need to be in now and then postpone to talk about later? I don't know. Do you get what I'm getting at? Yeah, man. I I I, I know what you're getting at. I don't think every bucket will always be full. Yeah. You know, I don't think if you can fill every bucket, you know, from from your health to your relationships to your finances to your business, whatever it may be. Um, I am pushing hard at the moment because similar to you, I don't have any key responsibilities. Mm. You know, I have a dog, which I love very much. And Beautiful. You know, he is the best. Yeah. You know, I don't have a partner. Uh, I don't own a house. So, you know, I can fly to Vegas for work. I can fly to Italy for work. I can you know, fly to Kyrgyzstan for this race. So, and, and plus, because, you know, gratefully, and you know, I'm very excited that people like what I do. You know, so oh, it's almost kind of like strike when the iron's hot. You yeah, know, and yeah, if, yeah. if people are enjoying it, you know, continue to give them more. Yeah. Um, you know, and breathwork is on the rise. You know, running is on the rise. So I just want to continue to help far and wide. And and I know inevitably, you know, when I when I meet a lovely, amazing woman, if anyone is listening, fifty <laughs> <laughs> uh, percent of this audience is actually female, mate. <laughs> so when I when I meet a woman, you know, and, and I want to have kids, and yeah. you know um life will change mm. you know and i'm aware of that and you know when that change comes i'll want to be able to look back and think you know i fucking did everything yeah. that i wanted to do and i'm in a time you know similar to you keeks where we can be 100 percent selfish yeah. i can be 100 percent selfish grow the business that i'd like to grow you know do all the things that i'd like to do um and scratch the itch until the cows come home yeah man there was one thing that you said in that 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 i absolutely love you said you were really like you're proud of yourself and I think in Australia, like we, we don't talk about that. We don't, I don't think, I don't think there's not too many people who are like, I'm actually genuinely proud of myself. A girl by the name of Alexa Leary, um, she just- I've done some breathwork with her. One of the greats. Yeah. yeah she obviously just, um, did you see the video when she um, qualified for the Paralympics? I didn't see it. No. So she, she just finished the race. She qualified and she's like, I am so proud of yeah, myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just like, more of that. Yeah. I was like more of that. Like, and it's, it's, it's being grateful. It's, it's honestly, and it's recognizing the fact that you've done all the hard work. Like I, I know you, you grind and you do a lot more than you lead on, um, in the background, but there's, I love seeing people do that. And I kind of want to like, I want to normalize that. I want to get that out there because we had the conversation before while we're having some tacos. It was just like, um, it was like, there is that tall poppy thing around Australia and people are quick to bring people down. But I don't know, I love knocking around crew who are willing to bring people up. And that fact of like, yeah, I'm actually proud of how far I've come in the last 10 years. I think that's super cool, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. And I, I love, um, I love hyping people up around me, Yeah, you know, and, and I think, I think people are often, men are often embarrassed to do it. You know, to hype people up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, you know, my, one of my friends, Victor, who is running today, you know, he did one hour, 17 and a half marathon, incredible time. Mm. You know, so I saw him running past as I was kind of running up. And uh, so I started screaming. You know, I was like, I was like, go hard, go hard, go hard. And I was just pointing at him, just screaming. Yeah, man. You know, so the people around me must have thought, you weird guy, <laughs> what are you up to? Yeah. And then he texts me after saying, man, I was in the Hurt Locker and you helped me so much. So right. huge thank you. I was like, fuck yeah. Like that's like, that just fires me up. I was going to say, does that give you energy? Oh, mate. Like, well, this is what I'd love to do in life yeah. is to to help other people yeah. and to bring people up. I'm, and if I can see other people around me succeed, like you, like Victor, like whoever, you know, I'm like, fuck yeah. These all great people in the world doing great things. Like more of that. Keep yeah. going. Mate, I love that. And I, I kind of want to tie the ultra marathon piece into this because, man, you're doing so many cool things. Like I I only knew you as the breath guy. Um, I didn't know you as an ultra marathon until probably a couple months ago. How did that kick off? Was that is that was that just an, an something before the breath work or was it uh, simultaneously? Like how did it come in? Yeah, man, I need to get so much better at my social media. Hey, like yeah. I'm terrible at marketing. Mate, like I'm, ter I'm terrible at like communicating. Mate, I, I want to see more of this on your socials. Like, I know, yeah, shit at filming stuff. Yeah. Um, so back in 2020, uh, an English running coach, Greg Pearson, was also living in Bondi. Mm. Uh, and I was putting loads of stuff up on my social, on, on my Instagram about nasal breathing whilst running. And, you know, the benefits of nasal breathing whilst running. So he said, oh, mate, you know, I'm a running coach. I see what you're putting up on socials. Can we have a quick catch up over a coffee? I was like, yeah, cool. Like, you want to talk about the nose? Let's do it. I like, fucking love it. I was like, I love it. It's hey, my bread and butter, man. Let's, let's talk about breathing. Yeah. So we we caught up and then uh, he was like, hey, you know, I'm I'm, I'm doing this uh, 100, 100 kilometer race you know, in the Blue Mountains, Ultra Trail Australia. I was like, oh, wow, that sounds amazing. I'd love to do something like that. 
And he goes, well, well, why don't you do it? And I'll train you. And I said, I've only ever ran one half marathon in the UK like three years ago. Mm. And I've never ran further than 21K. And he goes, I'll train you for three months and you know, you'll know you run 100K. That was four years ago. I've now done over, I think, 13 or 14 ultra marathons, you know, I... from everything from you know 100 kilometers, Blue Mountains, to running Bondi to Palm Beach, to 250 kilometers in Atacama Desert. Man, the 251 sound insane, yeah? Yeah, this is self-sufficient ones are pretty mad. So that, you know, the one I'm doing in two weeks in Kyrgyzstan. By the way, for anyone listening, Kyrgyzstan is near China. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, well, yeah, I was going to say, Obviously. I know exactly where that is. Yeah. I, I, honestly, this is terrible, but I think I signed up. Then I was like, where's Kyrgyzstan? Then I had to look it up after. I was like, oh, I guess I'm going there then. Gotcha. But the mount, you know, I just want to run in beautiful places mm. and and live an interesting, experienced life that I can look back on and be like, fuck, that was cool. Like, I did some mad shit. Yeah. And so, you know, the mountain range looks like the Italian Dolomites, but untouched. It's at elevation. It's 200 kilometers, self-sufficient. And, you know, I'm doing it with one of my good mates, Will, from from school. Yeah. You know, so we're going to fly in. He'll fly in from London. I'll fly in from, from Sydney. You know, we have five days just running through the fucking mountains, just like children. Man, it's so wild. Do you think there's, um, it seems like there's, you enjoy something about doing hard things. And like, I think there's a book maybe on this bookshelf, maybe it's not, um, Comfort Crisis by Michael Esther. Have you read it? I've heard of it, yep. Great. And he talks around how, you know, life is so comfortable these days. You know, we sit in an aircon room, we get food whenever we want. Like where everything is just so, t- like we can drive anywhere we want. Life is so comfortable. And if we can get out of that little comfort zone once a year, twice a year, so good, so good for us. And it gives you perspective. Like I, you did a uh, that walk, the Mark Hughes Foundation walk um, a couple of weeks ago. Huge. 150 Ks over three days, which for me, that's hard. Like that's a hard thing for me to do. There was a, a couple of stages where I didn't think I was going to get through it. And then afterwards I was like, oh, the, the proud thing. I was like, I'm so happy that I got through that because that's a hard thing for me. And everyone's thing is hard. But what Michael Esther talks about, um, he said, do something that's hard for you. And so if you run, if you've run a marathon before, you know, doing a 20 K half, it will be fine. But if you've only run five or 10 K, like a 20 K 30 K, that's going to be hard for you. And he said, what he, what he judges these little challenges or he does it every year. He's like, it's a 50, 50 shot if he's going to make it. And it's okay if he doesn't make it because he's committing to doing something hard. Tell me why you do hard things. So that was a very direct, quick question. Why is it? Like, you, why you, do I do hard why, things? Why do you do hard things? Well, why do you do these ultras? Like five days. Man, it's not easy. Like it's, it's, you're carrying everything, yeah? I mean, for a number of reasons. One is just a general experience, yeah. you know, to, to do something like that and have that, you know, in my mind as an experience that I've gone through forever. You know, mm. no one can take that away from me. Um, I also really believe that doing hard things will make you stronger and more resilient in the future. Mm. And, you know, with my challenges and you know various battles with mental health you know if i if i can do these hard things and i can control the controllables and i can go through the training the process whatever it may be you know what else can i do you know i can i can and it's a pride pride thing too you know once i finish a race i'm so proud of myself you know a lot of people think i'm this mad you know people who know that i do this but think think that i'm some mad savage who just wants to you know, who, who jumps out of bed and you know finds it easy like yeah. fuck man like i crawl out of bed so many mornings and i'm like I, you know, i've got to do this thing i've got to walk the dog i've got to go for a 20k run i've then got to go do work blah blah you know it's not easy but i know having the discipline rather than the motivation will help me become a better person in the future you know to myself but also everyone around me imagine your head probably goes to some wild places on like a five five day run yeah Bro, like, you know, I, one of the most mad experiences I went through, I, I ran like, I did like a six or a five hour or six hour run and I listened to Man's Search for Meaning by, by Victor E. Frankl, mm. finished the whole book and it was like a, a really transformative time, you know, I was going through some other stuff and, 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 you know, to listen to one book like that about Man's Search for Meaning, mm. you know, it's pretty mad. So yeah, yeah, you know, I get runners high a lot as well. So I could be running, listen to an incredible bit of music you know some filthy techno or some house track <laughs> honestly up, yeah, honestly yeah. man just comes on and I, I'm, I'll just be bawling my eyes out crying mm. so if anyone sees me running and crying I'm happy yeah. <laughs> I am good you have so like, many Chris are you right Rory? Just, like, yeah, I'm fine. just leave me yeah. I'm good but you know like you know, often there's not many things that make me feel that good mm. you know to get to get to tears of happiness and I get like 
you know, the shivers, the goosebumps down my, down my arm. You know, I almost want to like smack my chest and like, you know, it's, yeah, it's pretty weird actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as well. Is there, is there a low? Because you, we talked about, um, you obviously, you, you sat down and, and did a really cool Q&A with the Lululemon crew um, on the Gold Coast. A lot of them are marathon runners, ultra marathon runners. And a question from the audience was, uh, is there ever a down? Is there ever a low after something like that? Because it's a huge event. I imagine you're probably, you're obviously not just going to walk into it. Like you're training for months leading into these events. And then you're at the peak, you're at the climax, and then it's like, okay, what next? Do you do you have you experienced much like that? Yeah, massively, bro. And and you know, it's it's a bit of a battle where you know if I already struggle with bouts of depression and challenging moments, and then you add in these huge big events, you know, like this this you know, five day race, yeah. there's all there's always a low for me personally. There's always a low. But ways that I combat it would be you know booking in more races, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. You know, genuinely, you know, having more things in diary, yeah. more things to look forward to. You know, so after this race and then going to Europe to hang out with some friends, family, do yeah. some more work there, you know, so just constantly or consistently having things to look forward to. Yeah. Um, that's how I, you know, deal with that sort of feeling. But obviously like the, the highs way out, like outweigh the lows. hundred percent. And, you know, even, even with, um, even with ultra running and training, there's highs and lows, right? Mm. And I even said it on the, the, the panel where, you know, right. And, and it trans translates to life too, mm. you know, ride the high, sorry, Get better get this the right the right way around. Ride the lows and enjoy the highs. Mm. You know, cause cause it's cyclical, right? Yeah. With every low will come a high, you know, and then when you're at, when you're you know, if you're living life and you're up here, mm. tell you what, it's gonna come low at some point. Yeah. Something will happen. You know, you're just not gonna con- consistently win. And for example, you know, my last race I went to Colorado a few few weeks ago to to race a hundred K in you know, between Colorado and, and Moab, um in Utah. Mm. And, uh, you know, I had a drop out at 54K, you know, and I was gutted. I was, I was upset. I was pissed mm. off. I was angry. Uh, I was confused. You know, I had altitude just completely spanked me. Mm. Um, you know, so that was a massive low. Mm. But then, you know, I spoke to some people about it and, and they're like, look, if you put yourself into challenging situations, you can't expect yourself to consistently win. <laughs> Isn't that the truth, man? And I was like, true. Yeah. And I was like, why am I that arrogant yeah. to think that, like, hey, I'm just going to not win, but personally win at every event that I do you know so you know and as uh having a a challenge like that and a bit of a loss or a failure you know you learn a lot from it right I love that you can just compare the two because even um the crew I forgot who was talking about maybe it was Mon uh they were talking about how running it's just like you might be having you might have pain in your knee you might have pain in your ankle you might be sore physically but you said ride the low get through it. And then maybe in a couple of cases time, like you might be fine. And then I love how you just related that back to life. Cause it's, it's so true, man. And that's why, you know, one of the reasons that I, I love ultra running and long distance running is there's so many transferable attributes to life. Mm. You know, the, the highs, the lows, the challenges, the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever it may be, you know, mm. that is life. Right. But yeah. just condensed down into a two or three hour period. Yeah. You know, and it's just the life that we live. Two or three hour period, or sometimes like five days, if that's what you're, yeah. <laughs> if or, that's what you're gonna be doing, or fourteen hours sometimes, yeah. Man, what I, I, I think I could have done a whole podcast on, um, on just ultra marathon running, man, and and you know, I, I love, I love these conversations. If um, what do you think is the one thing that we we haven't spoken about today that you think would be super beneficial? Whether that's probably around the breath, um, is there anything that you that you think we we missed? You know, I, I guess one thing that just, just to touch on, you know, a lot of people perceive breath work to be this sort of spiritual, energetic practice. But, you know, my approach to breath work is much more around optimization of performance. Mm. You know, performance to me is how well can you show up as your best version, whether that's in the workplace, whatever that is for you in the community. You know, if you're in the pub or in a, in a uh, group training facility and at home, you know, with your partner, mm. your kids, flatmates. Using breathing, conscious breath work, conscious breathing, sorry, can be a great way just to optimize how you show up. So don't look at it too much as this woo-woo sort of spiritual practice. Mm. Just think of it as a tool that you have in your toolbox just to be a better human. Mm. I think that's just one thing I'd like to touch on. Brother, I love that. I think that's beautiful. How um how can crew get a hold of you? Because I know you're you're doing stuff in the sport, you do prize for even corporate. Like how how can we get in contact? Yeah, you know, most of my work is with corporates. I've worked with over 500 corporates, whether it's wellness days, quarterly events, team days, uh, off-sites, you know, work with 
Sydney Swans, you know, going to be working with, uh, you know, been working with a few of the Olympians who are now over in Paris. So, yeah, get me on Rory Warnock underscore R O R Y W A R N O C K. Email is Rory at Rory Warnock dot com. Mm. And funnily enough, my website is Rory Warnock dot com. <laughs> What a, no- what a narcissist. <laughs> man, I love it. It's fine, man. I love, I love that. I love that. But, um, mate, thank you. Thank, thank you, brother. Mate, thank you so much for, for coming on today. I'm, I'm so glad that we connected at the Whoop event. I'm so glad that I've got to know you over these last couple of months. I know I've only known you for a, a little while now. But you know when you just get like a vibe about someone, you think that they're, oh, well, I, I think this person's probably going to be around for a long time. I think you're one of those people, man. I think you've got... You've got such a genuine, authentic nature about yourself and you're the type of person that I kind of want to hang around because I want to emulate, man. So thank you. Thank you so much, bro. I appreciate it. Man, likewise, and you're a great dude, so keep doing what you're doing. I appreciate you. Yes, bro. Thanks, bro.